Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Uh, for our guests here in-house, we would ask that courtesy to check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. For those watching online, I remind you you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And of course, we will post today's program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. Leading our discussion is Luke Coffey. Mr. Coffey is director of our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy. He directs our research on the Middle East, Africa, Russia, and the former Soviet Union, the Western Hemisphere, and the Arctic region as well. He previously served us as the Margaret Thatcher Fellow. Before joining Heritage, he served at the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense as Senior Special Advisor to then British Defense Secretary Liam Fox. Prior to this, he worked in the House of Commons as an advisor on defense and security issues for the Conservative <coughs> Party. He earned his master's degree in politics and government of the European Union from the London School of Economics. He also received an Associate of Arts degree in Military Science from Wentworth Military Academy in Lexington, Missouri. Please join me in welcoming Luke Coffey. Luke. Thanks, uh, John, for the introduction, and thank you everyone for joining us today at the Heritage Foundation for this lunchtime event, uh, marking 16 years after the 9-11 attacks. Obviously, the anniversary is on Monday, but we decided to hold this event today on, uh, on the Friday before. Um, the, the event's titled 16 Years After 9-11, The Current State of Islamist Terrorism. 16 years after the 9-11 attacks, Islamist terrorism remains a serious threat to the United States and our allies and partners overseas. Over the years, this threat has changed and evolved, um, but it's still a very serious threat. Since that fateful Tuesday morning in September of 2001, there have been 97 Islamist terrorism plots or attacks on the United States soil, and I suspect you'll hear more about those from, from David who tracks these things. Some of these terrorist groups have had their ups and downs. Some have merged into larger groups. Some new groups have formed. Some have taken on the appearance and actions of insurgencies like ISIS, which has taken on the insurgent role of trying to create a, a state. While some ins traditional insurgent groups like the Taliban have taken on terrorist tactics. Many of these groups have also become household names. ISIS, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, alongside Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda itself has a number of franchises operating around the greater Middle East and North Africa to include Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. President Trump's recent Afghan strategy announcement is also a good reminder of the enduring nature that we face from this challenge. Think about this, an 18-year-old private serving in Afghanistan is only, was only two years old when 9-11 happened. While Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan is far less active than it was previously before 2001, and while there has been no successful terrorist attack on United States soil that has originated from Afghanistan since 2001, the region still remains a significant base and poses a significant terrorist threat to the United States and our allies. For example, uh, today, 20 out of the 98 groups that the U.S. government designates as terrorist organizations are found in the Afghanistan-Pakistan border region, 20 out of 98, so about one-fifth. Whether it's in Kandahar, Baghdad, Paris, uh, London, or New York City, this terrorism threat has killed and injured countless of innocents around the world. To discuss the threat of Islamist terrorism in the world today, how it has changed in the past 16 years, and what the U.S. and our allies can do to fight and deal with terrorists and this terrorist threat, we are joined today by a very distinguished panel. Mary Habeck is a strategic planner and an expert on military matters, Islam, and extremism. She teaches on Al-Qaeda and ISIS at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and at Georgetown while also running her consulting firm, Applied Grand Strategies. Dr. Habeck is also a senior fellow with the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Our next speaker will be Joshua Maservi. Josh is a senior policy analyst for Africa and the Middle East here at the Heritage Foundation. He specializes in counterinsurgency, non-state armed groups, and the security development nexus. He has testified before Congress on security issues related to Africa, 
and he has a, a tremendous on the ground experience having lived and uh, around and lived and been well traveled around Africa over the years. Our next speaker, uh, Robin Simcox, is the Margaret Thatcher Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He specializes on counterterrorism and national security policy with a particular focus on these issues in Europe. Robin came to the Heritage Foundation from the London-based Henry Jackson Society, where he built a reputation as one of the leading terrorism experts in Europe. He has testified before Congress on multiple occasions on issues related to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and their associated movements, and he's also provided oral uh, testimony to the House of Commons. David and Sarah, our final speaker, is a policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation's Allison Center for Foreign and National Security Policy. He specializes in homeland security issues, including cyber and immigration policy and the protection of critical national infrastructure. He has testified before Congress on homeland security issues, and he tracks the Heritage Foundation's database recording all the Islamist terrorism plots and attacks against the United States since 9-11. Um, after everyone gives their, uh, their comments, I ask each speaker to speak for around eight minutes, but there is some flexibility there. Um, we will have time for some questions. If, uh, I'll remind you again later, but in, as you think about your question, please keep it pithy, straight to the point, um, and identify yourself in any affiliation you might have. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Haybeck. Um, thank you very much. It's my difficult task to give an overview of where we're at in the war on Islamist terrorism uh, today in eight to ten minutes, po possibly longer. I'm trying to imagine a professor who could actually speak for just eight to ten minutes and it, nothing comes to mind. When I say eight, I, really, I know that really means ten or twelve. So. <laughs> it's, it's like the speed limit. Um, so uh, when you look at the position of the United States and our allies, um, in this war that has been ongoing now for 16 years. Um, one realizes that there are five important questions that still remain to be answered, despite the fact that experts and administrations have been working very, very hard on answering them. Um, the smartest people in the planet still do not agree about a set of questions that are absolutely vital for creating any strategy to defeat this enemy. And once we uh, realize this, we understand why we're having so much difficulty coming to a successful conclusion to this war, as administration after administration has come to different conclusions and therefore changed their policies to reflect this. We have gone first one way, then another. We've tried, it seems, nearly everything, and yet nothing seems to have succeeded. Looking around the world today, which government, which country can say that they have definitively defeated Islamist terrorism, that it no longer exists on their soil? The answer is nobody. So these are really difficult questions, but they're really important questions. And unless we answer them, find the right answers to them, we'll never find a solution to this problem. These five questions are, who is the enemy? We still don't know. We still haven't decided. There is, in fact, elite disagreement, expert disagreement about this question that I'm going to talk about in just a bit. Secondly, how should we combat the enemy? Or, you know, to put it another way, is this even a war? Thirdly, what's the relationship between the enemy and Islam? Fourthly, what's our objective in this war? And that leads us to the final question. What will winning look like? How will we know that we're even on the right track if we can't answer that question? So very briefly, to dig into any of those, and please feel free to ask for further clarification because I'm not going to be able to do the 45 to 50 minute lecture that this is in fact based on uh, for you. Who is the enemy? I'm gonna give you just a rundown of the different answers that, answers that have been given by different experts and different administrations. Is it an ideology? Are we in fact confronting something called jihadi Salafism? Is it radical Islam in general, that is Islamism and Salafism that need to be confronted? Is it something that's usually called violent extremist, that is the jihadists, the people that are carrying out actual violence around the world that need to be confronted and not the ideology or Islamists in general? Is it just even more narrowly Al-Qaeda and ISIS because they're the only ones who actually want to harm us? And by the way, when looking just at Al-Qaeda and ISIS, are we talking really about terrorism or are we talking really about insurgency as the main problem? That answer, that question is also 
not been answered, and it's a vital one for deciding how we're going to fight this war, and that gets us to how we should combat the enemy. If we decide that it is a terrorist threat, then obviously we should use counterterrorism, which is heavily dependent on law enforcement and intelligence and doesn't need to involve the military at all. We can simply sit back and drone them to death, and it'll all work out in our favor. Of course, in 2010, uh, then head of the NCTC, Mike Leiter, gave an interview in which he said there were 300 members of Al-Qaeda about left that needed to be droned, basically, in order to win this war. Last year, August of 2016, um, a lawsuit was brought in order to reveal just how many of these 300 had, in fact, been killed since 2010. Anybody want to make a guess how many of the 300 were killed? The answer is 2,500 <laughs> of those 300 were killed. It suggests that, in fact, attrition and counterterrorism will not work. Well, what about counterinsurgency? Massive boots on the ground, eight to 10 years in each country that's involved. I'd like to see the administration that can sell that to the American people. And also, if we um, think about how we should combat this enemy, we come to two very different conclusions. If you decide it's counterterrorism, you use law enforcement. If it's counterinsurgency, you have to use the military. But even if you say, okay, we have to use the military somehow, should we do it through allies? Should we work with allies and partners, or should we do it alone? And if we say with partners, well, maybe we can just put it off on partners and have them do it. After all, it's their problems, right? Their insurgencies that are really the problem in their own countries that are most threatened. But what we've seen over the past eight years is, in fact, that when we attempt to empower partners to achieve our national security aims, they use our money and our weapons to achieve their own. So if we want to achieve the national security aims of, for instance, the YPG or others of the partners that we've been arming and, and caring for, we will help them to achieve them, but we will not achieve our own national security aims. Thirdly, what's the relationship between the enemy and Islam? Some people say none at all, and some people say it has everything to do with it. That seems to be the two answers that are out there. Those of us who've been to Yale University and got our PhDs there understand that when you're given an answer A and Z, to a particular problem, the correct answer is L or M, right? <laughs> it's got to be someplace there in the middle, right? Um, it, I, I will tell you that my original interest um, that evolved into studying the extremists was, in fact, ordinary Islam, not the extremists at all. And I can tell you with a great deal of certainty that this includes about 0.0125% of the Islamic world or the Islamic community. And, by the way, it involves one theologian, one, one theologian, and a tiny, tiny minority of the community. Fourth, what's our objective in this war? Do we just want to keep ourselves safe and we let the rest of the world literally go to hell? Do we keep ourselves or our allies safe as well? Do we extend the umbrella to Europe, <laughs> to Japan, to elsewhere? Do we want to win? Or do we want to just manage these conflicts? Do we want to prevent extremists and extremism from spreading? Do we want to defeat the enemy? And what does that mean? We'll need a definition here. Do we want to destroy the enemy? That is, in fact, what the Trump administration has said they'd like to do. But what exactly does that mean? Do we want to discredit the ideology? Or, as some people have said, do we need to reform Islam? These are all huge questions that need answers before you can begin to define any sort of solution. Finally, what will winning look like? I don't believe there is one person who has said, here is the world we're seeking to create with our strategy. And yet, until you begin with that vision, you cannot, in fact, define or create a successful strategy. So what will winning look like? Does it mean no terrorist attacks on the US and our allies? Wow, that seems so difficult to create, doesn't it? Do we want just a few terrorist attacks? Are we willing to put up with that or with an administration that says that's their goal? We want a world in which just a few Americans are killed every year or just a few of our allies are killed every year? Do we want Al Qaeda and ISIS to no longer exist as organized groups? Or, as some people have put it, do we want to push them back through the spectrum and turn them into the group that they were in 1988 or 89? That is, a small terrorist group that can do nothing except for annoy people locally rather than carrying out global attacks. These five questions are key for understanding where we're at today, why we're having so much trouble defining and determining a successful strategy for defeating this enemy.
Thank you. Thank you. Josh? I think you were under time there, so you yielded a couple of minutes to Josh, I think. <laughs> it's a first. Okay, I'm going to take, take full advantage. Um, <laughs> I am, uh, so I'm going to do a quick survey of the state of terrorism uh, in, on the African continent and then offer a few uh, what I think are the most relevant themes, um, uh, potentially we get into more during Q&A, uh, and then I'll offer a few suggestions as well. And I am going to move quickly just uh, given the, the task in front of me. Uh, in 2016, the Global Terrorism Index um, reported that four of the t 10 countries most affected by terrorism were in Africa. Um, the African Center for Strategic Studies has identified 24 discrete terrorist groups operating on the continent today. Now, the overwhelming majority of them are affiliated either with ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but they, they do operate. There are 24 independently operating groups um, on the continent. It gives you a sense of, of uh, the scale of what we're talking about here. Uh, and I'm going to hit on what I think are the most important groups uh, starting um, in the east and moving to the west. So in Somalia, uh, you have al-Shabaab, um, one of the more famous al-Qaeda affiliates. Uh, depending on how you count, it's either the first or second deadliest terrorist organization in Africa. And it's been the case for a while now. I think of al-Shabaab as ISIS before ISIS. So al-Shabaab at its zenith controlled about a third of Somalia and it governed it. It had a bureaucracy, um, it taxed people, um, it, it dispensed a form of justice in, in its courts. Um, and this was all before ISIS uh, was, was ISIS. Um, the appeal of al-Shabaab um, was part of its strength, and that appeal reached globally, including to the United States. Um, I've counted uh, 33 American residents or citizens who have traveled or attempted to travel to the United States uh, to fight for al-Shabaab. Um, in total, there's 70 um, in open source reporting, um, American residents or citizens who uh, supported al-Shabaab in some way. That's almost certainly an undercount. Uh, there's, there's likely dozens or scores more um, that have not appeared for one reason or another in open source reporting. Um, but again, hopefully gives you a sense of, of uh, how powerful this group was. That's changed. Um, Al-Shabaab has lost uh, most of its major strongholds. It controls maybe 10% of Somalia today. Um, but that doesn't mean it's less deadly. Uh, it remains uh, a capable, uh, committed terrorist organization. Uh, in 2016, they started, as one measure of its strength, um, actually towards the end of 2015, they started attacking military bases um, manned by a multinational military coalition called AMISOM. Uh, they overran at least five, um, killing hundreds, uh, likely, of soldiers from Kenya, Burundi, uh, Uganda. Uh, these numbers are a little bit fluid because the governments involved don't like to release them, and Al-Shabaab releases inflated numbers, um, but probably five uh, AMISOM, which is the name of the coalition bases, have been overrun uh, by Al-Shabaab. They attack Somali National Army bases, uh, at least 12, um, over the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, that gives you a sense of, of the strength they retain, uh, that they're able to muster enough men to overrun uh, bases that are sometimes poorly defended, but still defended by scores of, of trained, ostensibly trained soldiers. Um, there, uh, there is a small ISIS splinter in Somalia. Um, I don't consider them particularly relevant. Uh, I think their, their prospects are very poor, actually, in Somalia. Um, they're, they're a splinter group off of, of um, al-Shabaab. And we can discuss that more if you're interested in, in Q&A, why I think that their prospects are, are poor. Um, so that's, that's a very quick look at al-Shabaab. Let's move over to Nigeria. Uh, there we have the people committed to the propagation of the prophets' teachings and jihad, uh, more popularly known in the West as Boko Haram. Uh, but that's the name I first gave you is the name they call themselves. Um, Boko Haram uh, really uh, emerged in its most virulent form after 2009. Its founder was killed, a man named Muhammad Yusuf. Um, their trajectory has been somewhat similar to al-Shabaab. They once controlled an area the size of Belgium, uh, approximately, in northeast Nigeria. A uh, multinational military coalition made up of neighboring states has, has since pushed it from all of those uh, major strongholds. 
but they haven't been able to eliminate it. Uh, it remains um, and is a, a highly capable organization still, uh, carries out a devastating attacks frequently, um, including leveling entire villages. Uh, most infamously, it kidnapped hundreds of, of schoolgirls from Chibok, but that was frankly, a, a, a fraction of the number of, the, of children specifically that they've abducted over the years. Uh, one um, sort of particularly terrible peculiarity of this group is that they use um, their suicide bombings uh, they've used over the years. More than half are committed by women um, and almost 20% by um, females identified as teenagers or children, including as young as uh, 10 or 12. Is um, again, hard to know precisely the, uh, the ages, but um, gives you a sense of, of just how vicious this group is. Um, moving over, uh, keep moving to the west, um, we'll go to the Sahel. So there's a variety of terrorist organizations operating there. Uh, a lot of them are, are focused on northern Mali. Um, but Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb is, is the most relevant one currently. Um, this group grew up out of the GSPC, which is an Algerian terrorist organization. Uh, they affiliated with Al-Qaeda uh, in 2006. They were involved in the takeover of um, major cities in northern Mali that required a French intervention to push them back as, as they continued to, to move south. Um, they recently um, joined with three other Al-Qaeda affiliates uh, in that region to form a terrorist supergroup, if you will. Um, and uh, it's unclear exactly what that's going to mean for their operations, but there has been an uptick in their activities. Uh, so worth keeping an eye on and, and worth being concerned about. There's a nascent G5 Sahel uh, counterterrorism organization that, that has just formed under French guidance. Uh, these are five of the affected countries have come together to uh, create a, a military coalition to, to fight this, uh, this terrorist coalition that, that has emerged. Um, then I'm gonna just jump up quickly to North Africa and then, and then move into um, some, some larger themes. Uh, North Africa, the biggest problem here is Libya, of course. Um, ISIS uh, at its peak had maybe 7,500 fighters uh, in Libya, which is a very significant number, uh, the most um, outside of Iraq and Syria. Uh, they also have been pushed out of a lot of their strongholds, but um, I've been told there's about 5,000 unaccounted for ISIS fighters. Don't know where they are, um, but almost certainly a number of them remain in Libya and are probing in the south, uh, looking for areas where they can reestablish themselves. Um, perhaps uh, particularly concerning is that they're looking to form alliances with tribes um, that operate throughout Libya, but again, particularly in the south, uh, that would make them a much more resilient and much more deeply rooted organization in Libya if they're able to pull off those sorts of alliances. Um, uh, Egypt uh, in the Sinai specifically, uh, the Egyptian army has taken terrible losses fighting um, an ISIS um, affiliate there. Uh, ABM, Ansar Bayt al Maktis. Um, similar to uh, AQIM's coalition, uh, ABM is uh, on, the up, on the uptick. Uh, the number of attacks are rising, uh, and the Egyptian army is, is clearly um, not, thus far at least, has not been up to the task of, of uh, militarily subduing uh, this group. So, um, just two uh, very quick points to think about. Um, <clears throat> As you study African terrorist organizations, you notice that some of the same names pop up um, at, in different organizations. And this is part of the, uh, the difficulty of, of fighting terrorism anywhere, but particularly in Africa. Um, <clears throat> Al-Shabaab leaders, for instance, uh, some of them trained in, uh, in Afghanistan, then um, were a part of uh, other terrorist organizations before becoming part of, of Al-Shabaab. Uh, so that... Um, even if you're militarily able to dissolve a terrorist organization, the problem generally doesn't go away. Um, it just re-emerges uh, in a different form. Um, and then Al-Qaeda in Africa um, generally tries to glom onto local causes and conflicts and then tries to steer them more towards their own uh, internationalist um, sense of, of what their war is. Um, and that, that prevents, presents some challenges, but also some opportunities for, for counterterrorism activities. Uh, 
Um, I see sort of two components of the problem. Um, and Mary uh, did a very good um, uh, recap of, of the ideological side of, of this problem. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, many of these groups are motivated by an ideology, um, usually a, a Salafi jihadist ideology. Um, there's not much the U.S. can do to affect that. That is essentially, um, uh, from my perspective, a debate within Islam that uh, the many Muslims, the great majority of Muslims who interpret their faith in a peaceful and tolerant way, they have to win that debate. Um, and there's not a, a whole lot the U.S. can, can do to affect that other than to um, sort of confidently and unapologetically um, stand up for our values and our worldview and uh, the way we see um, uh, the, the world. And, um, you know, youth in particular in Africa need to be a focus of these efforts. Uh, sometimes we, we fixate on local religious leaders who are generally older, and they do have a certain amount of authority, but um, studies show that those who are embracing radicalism generally reject mainstream authority, including faith leaders. So we need more creative ways to reach out to youth in particular, particularly youth who have influence within their peer groups. Um, a lot of, of uh, radicalization and recruitment happens peer to peer or friend to friend. Um, and then there, there are enabling environments in Africa that empower these groups, um, driven by poor governance, uh, poverty, uh, conflict, things of that nature. Um, not everyone who joins a terrorist organization in Africa is committed to the ideology of its leaders. Some people join for money, some for prestige, a whole variety of reasons. We need to try to, one, identify those fighters, which is very difficult, but um, something we should try to do, and then use a different approach, because you can potentially um, induce defections from them. Um, Amnesty program, Somalia has, has done several that have, that have been fairly successful. Um, ultimately though, with, um, with ideologues, you, you have no choice other than to kill or capture, uh, and hopefully create enough space for a competent government to deliver the kind of, of security and justice that uh, will dry up some of the support that these groups enjoy. Thanks. Thanks, Josh, for the overview on what's happening across the very large continent of Africa, <laughs> all in about eight minutes. Um, Robin is next uh, to discuss some of the European aspects of this debate. Yeah, <clears throat> and I could do this in like 10 seconds and just say Europe is really screwed up. Okay, <laughs> thank I'll you, David. <laughs> I'll try and provide a bit more context. Um, so 9-11 obviously an extraordinarily unique moment in, uh, in the history of modern times. But yeah, there's also something about it from a European perspective which is quite familiar because the, the movement that spawned the attacks in those days is one that European governments are broadly familiar with. And their citizens have been going off to fight in Bosnia and in Kashmir and in Chechnya in the years before. Um, not that European governments predicted something like 9-11, but there's some sense of familiarity about the people that perpetrated it. The question then being, and it's remarkable, remarkably naive question in, in hindsight, but could it happen here, as in Europe? Um, that is partially answered in March 2004 with the Madrid train bombings, but not completely answered from the European perspective because this is a attack that's largely viewed as Moroccan in origin. Um, I think it's only until the, with the July 2005 London suicide bombings where European governments truly realize the scale of the problem that has grown within their societies. This is a primarily homegrown terrorist plot that very specifically targets civilians. And in the years since, and of course in, in, to an extent the years prior, there is a, sen there is a, a series of plots targeting uh, civilians, often with a focus on aviation, often with its ties to Pakistan, uh, external um, planners in Pakistan. But I, I, I think that the after 2006, the threat essentially plateaus. Um, it's steady, but there is also a sense that European security agencies have a have a roughly an, an idea about how best to manage it. The Syrian civil war changes all that entirely. 
Um, thousands of Europeans leave to go and fight in that conflict. Um, obviously, many have come back and, and others are in the process of coming back at the moment. Uh, and the, the terrorism threat in Europe, of course, has wildly metastasized over the last few years. Um, just in the last few weeks, you've seen uh, two attacks in Spain, you saw an attack in Finland, you saw an attack in Brussels, you saw an attempted attack uh, in uh, Buckingham Palace in, in London. I was uh, just in London, just got back, and the organization I used to work for um, kind of in the early days, early-ish days of the war on terror, um, when we try and raise awareness about some of the things that were happening in the UK that we were concerned over, if there was some hardline cleric who was going to come and deliver some fire-breathing talk at a British university, we try and raise awareness of this by getting it in the media. So we'd say, okay, well, maybe we can get page eight of the Daily Telegraph and they'll cover this story. And so now some guy with a sword takes it to Buckingham Palace and starts trying to stab policemen with it. And it kind of feels as if that's on the bottom of the fold on page nine. I mean, it barely makes a dent anymore. This is how, I think, how numb, to an extent, people in Europe have become with the pace of these attacks. I think that's very concerning development. Um, I've done some, we, we published a, a paper on Heritage on this very recently about the tempo of attacks taking place in Europe now, of which I'll run through a few. Um, over 150 plots and attacks since the beginning of 2014 with a year-on-year -year increase. This isn't just focused entirely on Germany, France, and the UK, although that is where most do take place. There's been 16 countries in Europe that have had plots uh, targeting it. Over 350 people have been killed and over 1,500 injured. This year alone, we've seen multiple attacks in France and the UK, but also Italy, Germany, Austria, and Spain and Finland, as, as I just mentioned. Josh referred to earlier one of the trends that you're increasingly seeing in Europe, which is that of girls and uh, carrying out these attacks, um, especially teenagers. There was a, a French citizen based in Syria who had tremendous success with recruiting uh, teenage girls via um, Instagram, Instagram, via an um, encrypted messaging app such as Telegram. Um, his, that, that man who was Rashid Kasim has been killed now, but still you see the the trend going on. It's, it was very interesting when you saw and, and they managed to see the messages he was sending to the people he was targeting. Of course, there was the ideological, the theological component to it, which Kasim uh, referred to. But it was also interesting that he, he sort of played upon very conventional teenage concerns as well. So if a, a, a cell of all females, which he had helped steer to try and carry out this attack, was thwarted, he was then able to message the teenage boys in the, the, uh, the encrypted app saying, look at what your sisters are doing. This is, how, this is how shameful the state of the jihad is in the West, that the girls are having to do the things that you won't do instead. And then days later, you get a series of teenage boys taking up the call, trying these attacks involving uh, knives and in, in mainly centered in France. So the recruitment is, again, it's, it's unusual, but also kind of familiar. But also not just, I mean, this isn't just solely a young man's game. The Westminster Bridge attacker, Khalid Massoud, was in his 50s. So you're going really from, from both ends of the spectrum where there's a threat. Um, the, the, the research found that the desire to use explosives in these plots is still... Um, what aspiring terrorists try and use most often, but by far the more effective uh, route of attack for terrorist groups has been to use knives and increasingly vehicles. Um, the knife attacks, obviously, there's been, from the data we've got, over a one in two chance that anyone trying to carry out an attack like that will be able to cause either some deaths or injuries, but on a much smaller scale. The use of trucks and vehicles, which is what terrorists are increasingly using, has so far got a 100% success rate. There hasn't been any plots in Europe that have been thwarted 
where somebody's just tried to carry out an attack using a truck. And obviously we've seen the consequences of that in, in Berlin, in Nice, uh, in Stockholm, and also, of course, in Barcelona recently. Most of the people carrying out these attacks um, aren't in contact with ISIS, actually, although if they are, it is mainly electronic. And have also mostly not been trained by ISIS, but if they are trained, that, that takes place in Syria, and the plots are uh, much more deadly as a consequence. So, for example, the Paris November 2015 attack uh, is still the most deadly that has taken place in European soil um, since the Madrid attacks of 2004. Those guys had received training in Syria, were able to use explosives to coordinate their attacks, um, and obviously to, to quite devastating effect. We also looked in the, in the paper at um, the situation with refugees, which is a very, very pertinent one in Europe at the moment. Um, ten different countries have had um, plots that have been perpetrated by refugees into Europe. Obviously, it goes without saying that these aren't, this is nothing like the majority of refugees that have come into Europe, but it also needs to be saying that the threat picture has changed in certain countries because of the vast amount of numbers that have been allowed in. So, for example, uh, in Germany, um, there was more plots after 2016 in Germany than there had been the entire 2000 to 2015 period beforehand. The vast majority of those plots had come to some kind of Syrian refugee uh, nexus. So another stat to help highlight that, 5% of all plots in Europe in 2015 were focused on Germany. By 2016, it was 27%, so over a quarter. Why, has, why have things come to pass in this, in this way in Europe? Well, I think I'd offer three things, although there's, there's certainly a lot of other reasons I could offer. Number one is that the scale of the threat now is overwhelming to European security agencies. Not all of them have done a terribly good job since 9-11, though I think some have. And even those that are regarded as being, um, I suppose, some of, sort of kind of industry leading in their field, including the, the UK services, are now really struggling with the scale. In the UK, there's 23,000 people that are on the radar that are of um, concern as a possible terrorism threat. There's no way with the UK budgetary, uh, there's no way the UK could fund the amount of people at the moment to, to look at that threat and maybe the UK population would have concerns as to what kind of society we would live in if we did fund it. I think that's an open question. Um, secondly, the tactics by uh, jihadists have changed. There was a time when, when uh, radicalized people in Europe would be encouraged to travel to Syria to go and live in this newly formed caliphate. Now they've been encouraged to plan attacks at home. You've definitely seen a, an uptick in, in attacks since. And thirdly, I think the ongoing European problem uh, and the, with the failures of integration, I don't know whether any country could integrate two million people quickly in the way that Germany now has the task of having to do. I don't know if it's possible for any country, but certainly in Europe, we have really managed this badly in recent decades. And so now, you know, the UK takes a slightly different approach to France, of course. France takes a different approach to Germany. Germany takes a different approach to Sweden. And I think we're coming to the conclusion that none of it's worked very well. Um, and I suppose this is the, the section where I, I should have some great answers to what government should do instead. I don't. And on that pessimistic note, <laughs> I'll end. Wow. All right. David? Can you cheer us up? <laughs> Great, yeah. Um, on that uh, happy note, um, yeah. So, uh, so far we've you know, seen a lot about, we've heard about uh, what's been going on, you know, largely out, out in the world, um, not here in the U.S. homeland. But um, what happens out there doesn't stay out there. Um, what happens out there in terms of the ideological component, in terms of these various groups recruiting um, and inspiring other individuals has an effect here at home. And so one of the things which uh, Luke mentioned that we keep track of, but 
uh, track of at Heritage is the Islamist terror plots and attacks against the U.S. homeland since 9-11. I think we've actually, we may be putting something up on a screen. I don't know. We'll find out. Um, and it's, we're not going to really use it interactively, but it's, it is an interactive tool that if you're interested in, you can go in and it shows you little details about, a little bit of detail about each of the plots that we've found. Um, you can click in there for more information. Um, but from this data that we've gathered, it lets us to look at some of the trends and what we're seeing change and what we're seeing uh, get worse and what maybe is getting better. And so I just want to walk through some of the statistics, some of the trends that we've seen um, in uh, terrorism here at home. Um, we are up to 97 plots and attacks against the U.S. homeland since 9-11. Um, but that hasn't, it hasn't been sort of like a, a, a straight line. It's been up and down and up and down depending on um, different fa features of, of what's going on in the world. So, for instance, in 2014, we actually only had two plots and attacks. In 2015, we had 17. In 2016, we had 13, and we've had three so far in 2017. Um, I would offer that the one of the variables explaining this is ISIS. Um, of these numbers that I've just listed, 27 were inspired, at least inspired by ISIS, if not having some level of coordination with ISIS or communication with um, people on the ground in ISIS. So something changed. ISIS occurred. And then that is when we see these massive recruitment efforts um, and these insp this inspiration occurring. Um, of the 97, we've had 15 successful attacks. Um, once again, more recently, more have been successful. Ten of the 15 successful attacks have been in the last three years. So the attacks are being more successful as of late than they were um, earlier in the mid and late 2000s. Um, Omar Mateen's attack on the Pulse nightclub is by far the most deadly we've faced since 9-11, um, killing 49. Um, but if we've had 15 successful attacks, we've had 82 foiled plots. Um, three of these were foiled by luck. Think shoe, underwear bomber types, um, where it just didn't work the way it was supposed to work. Um, ten were foiled by or had significant help from international law enforcement, um, uh, especially a big, big assistance from the Brits in some of these plots, um, which I'll actually get into later. Um, and 69 plots were primarily foiled by U.S. law enforcement, U.S. intelligence or security services. Um, also similar to what Robin was talking about, um, it's primarily a homegrown threat. Uh, of the 97 plots, 85 have involved, uh, primarily involved a homegrown element. That is that the people who have engaged in terrorism radicalized primarily here in the United States. Um, uh, so uh, that just goes to show that this is a threat which requires different solutions than, for instance, just vetting. We, vetting is something which gets talked about a lot in this town. It's certainly very important, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. But homegrown threats, sort of by definition, don't necessarily involve vetting someone coming in. They're already, they're already here. Um, 41 plots were, were uh, foiled with sting or undercover operations. It's a very important tool that um, the FBI and other law enforcement organizations have. Um, and it all starts usually with either tips from the community or state and local law enforcement, or it comes from other intelligence leads from, from other intelligence tools. But it's one of our most successful tools in stopping um, terrorist plots here at home. Um, going to who is committing these attacks, um, Americans. Um, people with American citizenship are the most common um, attackers uh, in these plots. Uh, the second is actually the Brits, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's mostly actually due to the fact that there was a rather large plot, the liquid bomb plot, the reason you can't bring liquids on planes anymore, um, a rather large plot that was foiled with uh, British help. Um, but after the Brits and, and the Americans, uh, other countries don't really stick out as much. Um, their uh, nationality and citizenship becomes a rather unhelpful statistic. Um, there are Cubans, Algerians, Pakistanis, Trinidadians, Russians, Somalis, Albanians, and I could go on. Um, this sort of spread uh, comports with a DHS intelligence report, which was actually leaked earlier this year, which found that citizenship and nationality is a fairly unreliable, in other words, unreliable indicator of terrorism. Um, and that's so that that, car that carries itself out in 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 our data as well. Um, in terms of the, and I just want to quickly talk about targets, and then I want to move into what I think we can do. Um, 
Military targets have been the most common in the United States. Um, and by that, I mean military bases or personnel here in the United States, so not what's going on in Iraq or Afghanistan. These are U.S. military personnel um, out and about doing their daily lives or attacks on military bases. Uh, but there's been a rapid increase um, in attacks in public mass gathering spaces, so parks, you know, beaches, bars, convention halls, streets. Um, these have be this has really shot up lately, um, uh, and as Robin was alluding to, um, largely using simpler types of attacks. So vehicles, guns, uh, knives have increasingly become um, the weapons of choice. We would still see explosives, um, but and it's still something that many of them aspire to use, but increasingly they're using these simpler means of attacks. Um, thankfully, we, we haven't seen it on the scale as, as the Europeans have, but there are many, many similarities in terms of what's going on here. Just I would say it is slightly smaller, on, just on a smaller scale at this point. Um, and then just in terms of locations, New York remains sort of the, the main target um, in terms of like of all the cities in the United States. It's, it is targeted the most. Um, but even with this more recent wave of terrorism being inspired by ISIS, we're seeing that threat also start to spread across to you know, places from Miami Beach to, uh, to San Bernardino, you know, uh, community centers. So uh, it, the spread, while New York is definitely still the main target, it's, it's spreading out more and more. Um, quickly, I just want to touch on some tools, what I think we can do about this here at home. Not all of them are silver bullets, so not, also not super cheery answers for me, sorry. Um, first thing to keep in mind is whether we're going to do vetting or whether we're going to do sting operations, whether we're going to do any of these, tool, any of these types of operations to stop terrorists. They all rely on intelligence. Um, how we find these people before they attack is ultimately a, a function of the intelligence resources that we have. Um, and so when Congress is debating things, I know this year, for instance, the uh, FISA 702 program will be up for reauthorization. That's a program which provides immense amount of intelligence to our law enforcement, military, and, 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 uh, and foreign uh, intelligence officials to, to find these types of terror attacks. Sometimes they have nexuses to foreign terrorists, as like I said, ISIS being a, a big inspire and, and, and talking to these folks. So having the intelligence tools to locate these folks before they attack is ultimately the uh, essential part of what we're gonna do to uh, prevent these attacks here at home. Uh, another interesting thing which is coming up more in the news, um, what happens on social media and how we can work with the private sector on this? Um, think Facebooks and Twitters and what's being posted there. And this is a, a, a tough question because people don't, you know, as Robin also alluded to, we don't want to, I think, live in a world where Big Brother is watching every single thing that's going on on the internet and what's being posted. But at the same time, there are things where Facebook and Twitter know that there's someone who's posting something which is clearly not healthy and violent. And how cooperative are they in working with law enforcement to hand over that data so that we can find that person who's clearly advocating something which is to the detriment of American society. Um, we need to be doing more on that front. Uh, similarly, not just working with the private sector, but also state and local government. As I've mentioned, many of the tips that we get um, come from someone in a community who has talked to a state and local police officer, someone that the, the local cop on the beat hears from someone who thinks something's off with his neighbor. And it escalates to the FBI when the local police are concerned with what they have found. Um, so making sure that state and local law enforcement isn't just sharing, inf but also making sure state and local informa uh, governments aren't just sharing information up the chain, but making sure that the FBI and the federal government is sharing down the chain, making sure that their uh, state and local governments know what to be looking for and are trained to effectively uh, handle um, to to handle these situations and to be trained for worst case scenarios, active shooters and the like, knowing how to handle those situations, which unfortunately are becoming um, more and more common. Uh, and then lastly, as I mentioned, vetting. Yes, we've, uh, we've done a, a fairly good job in terms of vetting um, people who come. As I mentioned, most of the plots that we have do not involve um, foreign actors uh, who are coming in from abroad to hurt us. That being said, we can't afford to rest on our laurels. We have to make sure that we're always looking for what the enemy could be doing next. But ultimately, this is also a function of intelligence. How do we know that person X coming into the United States intends to hurt us? 
That's a question of the intelligence that we've gathered, but also intelligence that we're getting from our allies. And so programs that incentivize the sharing of intelligence between from our allies to us and also to, we would also want to share with them, those programs are immensely helpful at making sure that we prevent people from uh, harming uh, harming the United States and our interests. And with that, I think we'll do some questions. Great. Thanks, David. Well, thank you to our speakers. I think that gave us a good overview um, in their time constraints uh, on what the current state of the Islamist terrorism threat is to the U.S. and our allies. We have time for some questions. Um, I just remind you to keep your question uh, to the point. Please identify yourself in any sort of affiliation you might have. Um, and we, we have a microphone. Yeah. So the first we'll go to the gentleman uh, here and then we'll move over. Ken Dillon, Ciencia Press. This question is for David, but also any of the other uh, panelists. In ambiguous cases where it's not clear that it's a terrorist attack yeah. or not a terrorist attack, is there any reason to think that the U.S. government has, upon occasion, hidden the fact that it was actually a terrorist attack? Um, so I, when we're looking at these terror plots, I read the, I read the both news accounts as well as the official account provided by the FBI and the Justice Department. Um, and when I look at these incidences, I'm I'm carefully looking for uh, several things. I'm looking for a legitimate, credible threat of violence or actual violence. I'm looking for an ideological component. Is the person doing this because they? Um, uh, are they trying to carry out an attack against innocent actors um, generally for an ideological or a religious goal? Um, and I see, yeah, w how far along were they in, in this process? Was this just a pipe dream or was, or was there serious thought put behind this? Um, most of what I've seen out there, and like I said, our, our terror plot list, I think is a fairly good accounting of all the instances that where we – can credibly believe that real harm was going to be going to occur or did occur, and that, as far as I can tell from putting together, like I said, both all the open source information, um, that that is a fairly complete list. There are some cases on there that people would take issue with. Um, I can think of people who, um, you know, used weapons against their neighbor, um, such as a machete, um, but <coughs> the, the reason they did it was a personal one. It wasn't an ideological one. And so I leave those off the list because if it's a, you know, I'm going after the guy who fired me, that's not terrorism. That's you have a beef with your employer. Um, but other than those sort of instances, I think um, there's no reason to believe uh, Anything else has has you know, is fishy with that data, uh, Mary? Um, yeah, I, I obviously agree with you. Your your data seems really complete, and I I use it all the time um, when trying to understand what's going on, um, especially in the United States uh, when it comes to this sort of terrorism. Um, <clears throat> the only uh, place where I have seen some administrations perhaps fudging a bit and here, I'm thinking specifically of certain points during the Obama administration. Mm is what is their affiliation with a group abroad. So we have a whole set of groups that have, uh, or, or individuals, not groups, individuals who have claimed to have an affiliation with ISIS or even with Al Qaeda. And um, for several years, it was unclear in the first reporting uh, that they were even claiming this sort of affiliation. And only in uh, later reporting, maybe a week or two later, you would see in the actual indictment or uh, in some cases things that they wrote themselves when they were in prison, uh, that they had in fact, uh, during the attack and afterward, claimed to have this affiliation yeah. with either ISIS or Al Qaeda. Uh, but it didn't appear um, then in any sort of official pronouncement and statement. And in fact, uh, President Obama himself said that uh, during his tenure, there were no plots or uh, no attacks on the United States that had any connection uh, with a foreign terrorist group. And I would take exception to that yeah. because that's contrary, in fact, to the clearly stated opinion of the people who carried out the attacks themselves. And I'll say there's actually there, is, there are some places where, yes, I can think <clears throat> of a couple of the places where information was, was, was also fudged. Um, 
or, or claims were fudged, um, but we still count on, on our timeline. Uh, for instance, Fort Hood. Um, Fort Hood is still considered or yeah, uh, workplace violence, despite yeah. the claims, uh, the obvious claims of the attacker. Um, so I guess there are a few cases like that, but everyone, I, any reasonable person, looks at that and says terrorism. You have a follow up? No, I do have a follow up. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just say I'm a former State Department intelligence analyst. And in my opinion, uh, there have been two such incidents. One was the anthrax mailings of 2001, and the second was the crash of Flight 587 in New York on November 12, 2001. Thank you. Um, the gentleman here, uh, Andrew, just right there. Yeah. And then we'll, I'll work over to you. Yeah, American citizen. I choose to remain anonymous, but I would like to ask uh, a few that's questions. That's a great affiliation. Right there, so. <laughs> Dangerous times we live in. Uh, first off, I have to commend your uh, amazing disingenuity to say there are Americans and British, not Muslim British and Muslim Americans. If we can't even name the enemy, how are we going to deal with it? Okay, um, we had a problem with anarchists around 1900, and we kept them out of the country. And we threw ones out when we caught them or threw them in jail. And we had a problem with socialists. And we had a problem with communists in the 40s and 50s. And we couldn't get in this country if you were a communist. And we tried to get rid of the ones we had and make sure we kept an eye on them. Uh, I don't know why we can't use the same policy. I mean, basically, keep out Muslims because not all, not all communists were out to destroy Americans, but a lot were. But the ideologies of, that I've mentioned and the ideology of Islam well, it's you know, 1,300 years we've lived beside Islam and has been unrelenting attacks from Islam. And it is in, it is in the Quran, uh, this kind of implacable foe uh, of, of Christendom that they seem to keep waging war against. And so I don't understand why we let these people in and why we keep them here. It seems like we need to protect our nation first. That's the first duty of the state. Um, I'll, I'll answer this. Uh, I served very, with very gallant and brave Muslims when I was in the U.S. Army. Um, they wore the American uniform, American flag. They were American just like I was. And um, I, I think that's probably a very un-American way to look at um, the contribution that Muslims make to U.S. society. But thank you for your question. The, okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, this goes back to my original uh, point that some people in the United States uh, think it's um, all about Islam, and others think it has nothing to do with Islam. But my original interest during the 1990s was, in fact, um, ordinary Islam. It wasn't the extremists. And only after 9-11 did I get interested in extremism and really start studying it. And I can assure you that what happened to Islam during the 19th and early 20th century was a reformation and enlightenment that transformed the religion in very significant ways, ways that the extremists reject. So if you go back and you take a look, at the entire Middle East, they, those countries that were founded there were founded on secular grounds. From, you know, you go across the entire Middle East, uh, Libya, uh, Egypt, Syria, you know, Iraq, Iran, uh, Pakistan, it doesn't matter which country you look at, it was founded on secular grounds because there had been a serious reformation of, of the religion and of people's views of their relationship with the world. Um, that, that's what's being rejected by these guys. And it's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to talk about reforming Islam, because uh, in, the, in the minds of many ordinary Muslims, they actually tried this reform, and it led to Saddam Hussein, and it led to Gaddafi, and it led to the Shah, so, or Mubarak. So to them, they like, we already tried this concept, and it led to failure. Gentleman there, thank you. Right, uh, my name's Dick Kaufman. I'm a retired CIA officer. And actually, uh, in the early 80s, I was involved in really the first effort by the agency to establish operational capabilities against what we then call international terrorism. Um, and my question, it's kind of a tough one. Uh, several of you alluded to the use by terrorists of the internet. Um, in, in a broad sense, but also very specifically social media. Uh, 
uh, and how difficult it is to, to deal with that. Now, um, we know that, that, that social media organizations very closely monitor what's posted um, for political content, for, um, if you will, societal content. So I guess my question is, how hard is it if they do that and do it legally and do it ubiquitously? Why can't they do the same regarding terrorist content, which, as you all know, is not particularly hard to spot? Yeah, so um, when it comes to certain organizations, as, as I was trying to to touch on some of them do try to do this and so for instance i believe facebook is actually trying uh, they're trying to put their best foot forward on this they do try to share that information with with law enforcement authorities they're trying to get into all the sort of technical solutions that they can come up with to see how can we ferret these folks out they've promised um as is currently a hot topic the concept of um ai um that will the computers will sort of start learning and figure out how to identify this information on its own. So they are working on that kind of stuff. Other organizations, though, are not necessarily gung-ho on sharing all that with, with the government. So, um, and some of it might be this, this sense of we don't want the government to know everything that's going on and we don't want to give them access to our data, perhaps because of Big Brother concerns. Um, sort they of themselves are functioning. And they, because they have their, they have their, they have their terms of service, and they, they enforce them as they will. Yeah, um, but they view that as the terms of you participating on their, their mech, their, their service. Um, that's there's a different question about how much they want to turn over to, say, the federal government. Um, and like I said, there is a balance. I think to be struck there. I don't. I, I know there's there's laws out there right now, but how we want to refute these things. I. I came across a case, I forgot what it was, I think it was Twitter. Um, he, an individual posted something about, uh, I think it was a mosquito, and he, so he said, I killed it. And he basically said, I killed it, it was, you know, bloodsucker, yada, yada, yada. And, uh, but had, he didn't actually say mosquito, it was just a picture of a mosquito he had killed. Twitter's artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever, saw, I killed it, I want to kill it, whatever it is, and got him for it. And then he's like, Mosquito, and I think this was in Japan, and it may have been a translation issue. I don't know, but that's an example of some of the challenges we face. Because then, how do you get into you know wrongful folks being being sold that their stuff is you know terrorist or, or violent content when it's clearly a joke or clear? These are some of the challenges we face, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't address them. Because I'm I'm with you in saying that we we need to be doing more in this space because that's where these are they're communicating, um, and then of course encrypted communications is a whole nother. Uh, whole other bag, but uh, well, that can be another question. Robin and then Mary. So I think that the difficult thing in this is that there is going to be, is that you, you referred to terrorist content, right? And so the definition around and, that. And communication. And communications. But, and some of that, some of it's going to be really easy, like beheadings, videos, everyone in the room is going to agree, easy case. The case that David referred to about the mosquito, everyone's going to agree, an easy case. The problem we're going to have mm -hmm is those areas where there's going to be shades of gray and it's going to come up with First Amendment concerns. So, for example, the, a speech put on YouTube, for example, where someone, a, a cleric, calls for the creation of a caliphate. The caliphate has historical context, and let's say he calls for it without calls to violence. Now, obviously, we don't, no, no one is going to be pro caliphate in the Middle East or pro-expansionist caliphate. But does that constitute terrorist content? Because we work with some groups in the Middle East and that would be broadly pro-caliphate. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm talking about operational communications. I'm not talking about uh, some cleric somewhere giving a speech about something, which I understand has a, has a bit of ambiguity and vagueness. I'm talking about clear use right. of social media internet to yeah. well, I'm, I'm, trying, yeah. I'm talking about getting in front of terrorist acts. Yeah. I, th I think they can do more because some some content, for example, child exploitation material, there's, uh, there's programs built into certain communications where they are flagged up if they're being sent internally on emails, for example. 
I don't think there is that. But it, to me, it still seems as if Silicon Valley doesn't treat terrorist content in the same way as it does some of that. Mary, did you want to? No. No? no? Okay. We have time for a few more uh, gentlemen there. Yep. Uh, no affiliation. No. You have a name? The, after 16 years, I was expecting from this panel, rather than going to the sensational headline news, to go to the real issue that why. Why this happens? Why uh, the old mothers, you know, uh, suddenly got to this level? And uh, also when that gentleman talked about, uh, you know, two million uh, refugees, why those refugees, under what condition those refugees were created? The point that this panel, I believe, should go more than just headline is to see the reason and how that could be resolved, rather than uh, uh, there is something else over here, so we got to go by intelligence or by killing, as a, uh, somebody said to kill, I believe that uh, Mary said, uh, killing all the ideologues. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the point. Uh, my question is, do you, any of you have any idea why are this happening? Or happened? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Okay, then Josh. Yeah. So um, I actually teach an entire class on this. <laughs> so I'm, and um, I'm writing a paper right now that's uh, uh, germane to this, uh, this question as well. Um, first of all, though, I need to know, what do you mean by why is this? You say this. What do you mean by this? I mean, I'm talking about the one, the why this phenomenon, or why this... Uh, why terrorism? Terrorism mm -hmm. okay. has been created, or mm -hmm. uh, it has become one of the most uh, the important issues of the you know, 21st century. I, I think, um, just broadly, the answer that I would give is um, the failure of um, nearly every single regime in the, in the Middle East, the broader Middle East, to create successful societies. So one after the other, they created societies that either failed economically, were so incredibly corrupt that uh, they lacked any moral sense or vision at all, um, failed to uh, provide opportunities for people to actually thrive and grow. So if you read um, theories about revolutions, where revolutions come from, they actually don't come from people who are poverty-stricken. Poverty they come, in fact, from people who have been promised more than the regime or the administration can deliver. And a lot of people in the Middle East were promised better lives, and instead they, they got Mubarak, or they got Saddam Hussein, or they got um, a society where if your last name was not Ibn Saud, you were not going to go anywhere. And you could be a really charismatic, intelligent, um, executive type who, was, who should have been running your country, but you didn't happen to be the right kind of Saudi citizen, so you were not going to go anywhere. Uh, our own revolution was created uh, by upper middle class, very rich people who had tremendously good educations and understood they didn't have enough power. To, to match their educational level and their, their wealth. So to me, looking across broadly the Middle East, that's what one sees. But once it sort of became a movement, then it began to appeal to people beyond that. And in places like Indonesia, which has been broadly successful economically and in many ways, you're in fact seeing a growing extremism uh, because they're offering something new and fresh and different from what you believe is a kind of stagnant society that was created for you. So it's, it's, got, it, it's become even more of a, a sort of social phenomenon um, in places like Turkey or Indonesia, which, which once were um, viewed as successful uh, secular societies. Josh? Yeah, um, I tried to get this at this a little bit in my remarks, um, and I agree with 
with what Mary said vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Middle East, you look at there was a, a succession of ideologies that were tried, right? So nationalism, uh, even secularism, and, and they all failed. And uh, Islamism is, the, is, is um, one of the, the more recent um, varieties of an ideology that, that is being tried. Um, as, as far as Africa, though, um, you know, Africa is different than the Middle East, of course, and it, it doesn't have that history of, of trying various, uh, you know, like pan-Arab nationalism, for, for instance, doesn't apply, or the failure of pan-Arab nationalism doesn't apply to, to Africa. Um, and in fact, uh, you had incidents of what we might consider terrorism or at least um, uh, aggressively religiously inspired violence in Africa uh, long before this current wave. So, you know, the British fought um, uh, a man they referred to as the Mad Mullah in, in Somalia uh, during the colonial, colonial era. Uh, it was the first time um, a European power bombed any part of Africa. So it was uh, some sort of um, milestone, I guess. But uh, he was absolutely um, a religious leader who steeped his uh, his activities in religious um, uh, language. So I, I think in Africa, um, one trend that I, I tend to look at, and it's, it's difficult to draw a direct causal relationship, but <clears throat> um, traditionally Africa was a, a subscribed to a very syncretic, um, tolerant uh, practice of Islam, which is Sufism. And... Uh, starting in the 60s and 70s, throughout the 80s, 90s, that began uh, to be replaced um, by Wahhabism, sometimes called Salafism. There are sort of esoteric differences between the two, but they're, they're similar. Um, and that was pouring out of Saudi Arabia specifically, but also some of the other Gulf states were uh, funding the spread of this, um, what, what is a very um, ascetic, fundamentalist, uh, confrontational, uh, practice of, of, of Islam. And uh, again, drawing direct causal relationships is difficult, but there's no doubt that that sort of proselytization has increased the pool of people in Africa who share much of the same um, sort of uh, theology as do all the terrorist groups um, on the continent. So every terrorist group in Africa is Salafi Jihad. They all subscribe to um, this, uh, this, this ideology. Um, now again, all Wahhabists and all Salafists aren't Salafi Jihad. The Salafi Jihad is a small subsect of that. But again, you, you've, um, you know, there was this growth of, of this ideology on the continent. <clears throat> and then I think you marry that with dysfunctional states, states that don't control their territory well. Um, and you, you have sort of a, a really deadly cocktail uh, that has seen the rise of, of these groups. Um, we have, I'll take, uh, we have time for two more. Um, all right, we'll, we'll squeeze in three. The, the, well, actually, I was going to pick the gentleman here, but we'll go him next. That's fine. You first, and then, and then the lady in, in the corner. So, oh, there's so much kindness in the audience. Sorry. Um, so, but keep it quick. Because, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so I'm Xavier from School of Foreign Service. Um, just on, uh, my question is for Dr. Habeck. Um, is there a particular style of democracy which might be especially effective in um, perhaps helping to stabilize some of these um, states in the Middle East and alleviate the sort of the very diverse tensions that exist? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. Um, to me, the political solution is uh, not so much for us to find you know, what has worked elsewhere and then to sort of propose it or support it in the countries that we're dealing with, but rather to figure out what the um, people of those countries themselves consider to be legitimate and to support that. So for instance, in Morocco, you have basically a constitutional monarchy that has done a terrific job of reforming itself and um, representing the wishes of the people, so much so that uh, there was an attempt at a revolution there uh, back in 2011, and it went nowhere. And there have been attempts to create these kind of groups and to appeal to people um, on the basis of this um, jihadi salafism.
Um, and uh, the people who have been most attracted to it have, have been actually gone elsewhere. So it's, it's a, an example of a country that's been highly successful at um, conferring a sort of legitimacy on the government and uh, uh, representing the people in a way that is recognized as legitimate by the people themselves that I think um, we can look at as a, a, successful, a successful example without having to say you must have a democracy in order to represent the wishes of the people. Um, gentleman in the back now. Guadalupe yep. Vieri, a recent graduate from the Sanford School of Public Policy. Um, one of you mentioned the, the use of youth programming in order to address some of the root causes of radicalization to violence. Yeah. And I know that's still a pretty new area of like mm -hmm. development programming. Do, are we starting to see any hard data or results that say, look, these programs are actually keeping youth in countries either in Europe or the US or in the developing world from you know, joining these organizations or picking up a weapon and attacking their communities? Yeah, so I referenced that. Um, the reason I, I spoke about it is because I, I meet frequently with NGOs that do this sort of work, um, and I, I respect the work they're doing and think they're onto something, and they, they have done a lot of interesting studies uh, trying to get at um, uh, what drives people to violence, um, and, and, and not just terrorist violence, but, but all forms of violence. Um, but no, I have not seen, and I always press them to, uh, to come up with those sorts of long-term studies uh, over, and, and it's hard. I understand why they haven't done it. It's expensive. It's, um, it's difficult. But something I always say is, uh, you know, we do need to see those numbers. If, if you're a policymaker um, and you're being asked for $50 million, or I don't know what the figure would be, even $1 million, you need to have a pretty good justification for spending that money. And it, it needs to go beyond just anecdotes about how this person and that person seem to be doing better. But then three years later, they have no idea where that person is. Um, but there's also, uh, but there is no doubt that there is this phenomenon of youth um, being involved in specifically in terrorist violence. And again, the peer-to-peer the -peer recruitment model is appears to be more and more relevant. So that the youth, um, it's not, there's no silver bullet here but that needs to be a major part of, of um, study, a major area of study, and then determining uh, how we can effectively uh, intervene with them. Yeah. Oh, David? I'll just, I'll just quickly add, yeah, because I know, I know there's studies in the US that are same thing. They, they prove sort of mixed results. Um, there's some, there was a study that looked at what, was, what's, what is called a CVE, countering violent extremism, and there's, different people have different problems with, with that acronym. Um, but someone who tried to look at the efficacy of these studies, and it was, yeah, and so, like, it was the Somali community in Minneapolis, and they tried to look at how are these communities, how are these programs affecting? Um, and, yeah, especially they see that there's peer-to-peer -peer recruitment in that community, often among young Somalis, but who's getting the money? Is it being effective? What, has it changed lives? And this the study that was one of the studies that was done by a very reputable organization found like mixed mixed result and so yeah I definitely need better data in, in my opinion great and our final oh, did you want to okay and our final question to the lady uh, okay. oh okay well we have time we can squeeze one more anyone else okay the lady there yes oh please wait for the microphone thank you this is not a question, but Mary, you just said something about stabilization, and it was really absolutely spot on. I've lived in Pakistan, Afghanistan, or served, Afghanistan, Saudi, Ukraine, that's enough. Um, and, and bottom line, what we're finding in Afghanistan and Pakistan is with regard to stabilization, it is exactly what you said. If we're working with smaller groups, not this huge program, but smaller groups, and work with the locals and asking them, what do they need to have? What do they want? That's actually working. So. Yeah, if I could just say something about that, because this is a USAID's kind of philosophy, right, that they have customers that they're working with, and you sort of figure out what's relevant for them and what works. But um, there are sometimes uh, groups that you're working with whose vision is so narrow 
they don't look beyond to the bigger picture of where their nation is heading. And that's um, a, a, something that I think is very difficult in places like Afghanistan where you have basically four or five different nations, really, that are attempting to live together in one country. Uh, in Nigeria where you have uh, probably more than that who are attempting to live together in one country and who all have different visions for what they would like to see their country become. So it's, um, I understand that Morocco is actually kind of an easy uh, one because it doesn't have these deep sectarian divides or tribal divides, um, language divides that some other countries have. Um, and, uh, but there are, there are obviously techniques that are also worked out for them as well. And then the other point I would make is that's great for them, but we have to also think about what the enemy is up to because the enemy is also, you know, got a vote, as everybody says, and they're pushing their agenda with violence. And they're pushing some of these communities to polarization and to violence with each other, um, something that helps to explain why you see in Africa in particular so much violence. Um, since the 1990s, they took advantage of already existing problems and have, have purposely exacerbated them in order to drive one community on the other side. And in fact, Zar Qawi, who one could say is the founder, real founder of ISIS, said that was his whole purpose in Iraq. He was going to polarize the communities and set off a civil war, a sectarian civil war, by killing Shia. And then the Sunnis would be forced into his arms. So this is not just something that's occurring, you know, somehow naturally. These are tensions that have always been there. They're actually working to exacerbate them and create this kind of violence and take advantage of it then. Right. Right. On that cheery note, um, thank you for, again for coming today this afternoon to listen to this panel discussion about 16 years after 9-11 and the state of the Islamist terrorism threat. The, uh, the, the video of this will be available on heritage.org, I think within 24 hours for sure, but usually it's available before then if, if you're so inclined to watch it again. Um, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.